Hello everyone and welcome back to Beyond Boxes. This is a podcast episode so you can listen to it wherever you listen to your podcasts or you can watch the full episode. Today I am very happy to be joined by Meg John Barker. Welcome Meg John. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So today we're going to be talking a bit about going beyond binaries. Now there's so many things we could explore, but we're going to be focusing mostly around uh, sexuality and gender. So before we begin, can you tell the audience a little bit about which labels, if any, you identify with? Mm, Absolutely. So with gender, I identify with non-binary and also with trans. Um, and then with sexuality, with queer, um, and somewhat with ace, with the ace spectrum. Um, and historically, I've used bi and been quite involved with bi activism as well. When you say non-binary, let's start for those who are unfamiliar with it. Yeah. <laughs> let's start by defining a bit what you mean by non-binary, and uh, and then you can tell us a bit about you and uh, why those labels are important to you. Yeah, well, I think non-binary is really important for gender and sexuality for me. Um, So it's that I've never um, felt like um, in the binary of man or woman in terms of gender, that those didn't really apply to me. And then I didn't feel similarly in the binary of gay and straight. And that's how the world tends to see like gender and sexuality. It's like you're th- you're this or you're that, you're man or you're woman, and then you're attracted to men or women. Mm-hmm. And for me, like in both, I don't really fit into that experience um, of like being just one gender or being attracted to just one gender. Yeah. And so, do you identify as trans then? If you don't, identify- yeah. Um, it's a, it's a slightly tricky one. In a sense, you know, what trans means is if that you didn't stay in the gender that you were assigned at birth, you know, so when they said it's a boy or it's a girl. And so in a sense, all non-binary people can be seen as trans because very few people are assigned non-binary at birth. I mean, nowadays, some people are raising kids gender neutral. So there's a question, you know, there of whether, um, but yeah, in general, generally speaking. But however, not not all non-binary people find trans to be a, a comfortable label for them. So it, it's you know, for for me, they they come together, um, and and also I like the sense in trans that that gender is something that can change over time. Um, again, not that's not true for all trans people. For some trans people, I have a very sense fixed sense of their gender staying the same over time but for me there's something about fluidity and flow in Mm. the in the word trans as well that I like interesting and so Mm. how did you how did you come to realize that you were non-binary both in terms of gender and sexuality how did you know that that even was an option Um, because (laughs) I think sometimes you know a lot of people struggle with their gender identity or sexual orientation or sexuality in general but so tell us Mm. a bit about how you came to find out about these things how you realized that they apply to you and why these Mm. things are important to you yeah, well, I mean, I, I grew up in the 1970s and 80s, so like these things weren't a thing, you know, mostly back then. I mean, there was a concept of bisexuality, but with a lot of stereotypes. And then I think with trans, there was really only visibility of sort of trans women back then. And again, with, you know, incredibly negative stereotypes. So there was no real sense for me growing up that being trans masculine would be possible um, or be, and certainly not that being non-binary was possible. Um, so I think the, the bisexuality one came first, like for a long time, I suppose, I assumed that I was attracted to men and that my relationships with women were friendships. And then it became like, oh, hang on a minute, you know, there's sort of, there's, there's something pretty intense emotionally and erotically going on. Mm, um, and so it was kind of like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's maybe. Um, and so by, by, yeah, by university times, I was identifying as bisexual. And then I got quite involved with the bisexual community um, about 10 years after that, sort of around my late 20s. Um, and that was really supportive, you know, of kind of living it, living it more. Um, and then non-binary was a lot later. So there was definitely a sense, you know, a real sense at school of like, 
people are lining up in boys and girls and I don't feel like I fit in either of those rows maybe a little bit more the boys than the girls but still not you know I'm certainly not these stereotypes of masculinity you know um you know I'm not sporty and that outdoorsy and that kind of thing um so yeah that that really came I was yeah I was wondering about trans masculine or whether I was a trans man and then luckily just around that time which was sort of in my mid to late thirties, I guess, um, a few people were starting to come out as non-binary and CN Lester, who's an amazing creator and musician. Um, I came across their um, website and it was like, oh, wow, somebody using they pronouns, somebody having a gender neutral name, that's something I can do. Um, so there's something about role models in here, I think of just how important it is to see somebody else doing it and being like, oh, wow, that's a thing. And then, yeah, that's when I kind of came out as non-binary and started to, yeah, change my name and started to use they pronouns and had a few uh, medical interventions as well. Right. And I think what you're saying about role models makes sense. And I guess that is one of the advantages of social media and things these days is that, you know, especially for people growing up in rural areas or who don't have access to as many, like as much of a di much diversity in terms of who they encounter and interact with. Having social media means that so many more people are able to see that there are more options out there and mm. identify with what feels right for them and be able to put a label on a feeling that they already have had but that they thought maybe they yeah. were with and um so that's that makes sense and mm. um, I'm sure you've become a role model for many people as well it's really nice yeah to hear occasionally somebody say the same you know it's like like there was CN and then there's me and then there's a few people who saw me me talking about stuff and that helped them and now you know other people are seeing them and feeling like it's possible there's something really beautiful about that sense of um opening people's possibilities you know in the ways that we live our lives yeah yeah that makes sense so let's talk a little bit about pronouns and then we'll talk mm. about binaries and why you know sort of the harm in binaries why question binaries um mm -hmm. so you say that your pronouns are they them yeah and again what's the importance of pronouns and what's the sort of yeah what's the importance for you in 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 those pronouns and in people using those pronouns correctly mm, yeah it's I suppose there's something about being mirrored accurately by the world I think that's really important and that so many people who are marginalized especially when their um their identities are somewhat invisible you know that they experience a lot of kind of um yeah the world like misgendering them or the world you know, for, for bisexual people, putting them back in the closet effectively when they've already come out, but then that somebody assumes they're gay because they've got a same-sex partner or something. So that there's something about this invisibility or erasure that's, we know it takes a huge toll on people's mental health because there's something really um, damaging, you know, about you've got one experience of yourself, but the world is reflecting a different experience. It's kind of crazy making, you know, that being in that place where you're you're expressing your authenticity, but it's just not being read or heard accurately by others, I think. Um, so the, I think pronouns is, is one, you know, that's where sexuality and gender are a bit different. Because when I first came out as non-binary, I really, weirdly, I kind of expected it to be a similar journey to the bisexual one. I was like, oh, I've done this already. You know, I've, I've come out as a, a non-binary thing before. It would be similar. But of course, gender is just so much more like, um, out there I guess you know people are people constantly gender someone you know even I you know if someone's walking down the street towards me you know probably one of the first things I'm doing you know without even thinking about it cognitively is to you know put them in a gender category as well as maybe an age category or whatever and so 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 you're just confronted all the time by the you know the the barista saying sir or madam or by somebody using a, a he or a she pronoun and right. so I think yeah the importance of the pronouns for people is that somebody is mirroring their experience of themselves accurately and there are a number of different possible pronouns for non-binary people you know some people just prefer people just use their name repeatedly without any pronouns there are some pronouns that have been kind of uh, invented or created that are non um, that are not gendered 
Um, but a lot of non-binary people default to they them because it's familiar to people that they already use it. So if you don't, you know, if, if you don't know the gender of a person, if you're like, oh, somebody's left their handbag on the bench, I hope they come back for it. You know, you would use they in, under any circumstances where you don't know the gender of a person. Um, some people get into these really convoluted arguments about it being plural rather than singular, but, pe but people have used the singular they to refer to one individual back as far as Shakespeare and Chaucer. So it's definitely, um, you know, fine to use in that way. And also, you know, some of us do experience ourselves as plural, as having multiple genders on multiple sides of ourselves. So I quite like the fact that it's also a plural, um, like it can be used for singular or plural. That, that fits me really well. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting that you specifically like that that it can be used as a singular and plural pronoun. Yeah. And, and it's so true. I remember I was trying to have this conversation with someone and explain what non-binary meant and explain that, you know, there was more than two genders and all of that. And they were like, again, I just said they completely naturally <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, because the, this person is does have a specific gender, but in this story, it's irrelevant. So that's, and you maybe you're anonymizing them. So, exactly, yeah, exactly. And I'm trying yeah. to anonymize them. And so that mm. just shows how easy and fluid it is to use they, them, even when people, and again, I, so I was telling this person, I was like, you know, so some people don't identify as a man or a woman and da, mm. da, 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 da. And this person then was like, well, if a person isn't he or she then what do they use and they did it completely unconsciously yes, they said, they what do they it, yeah. use? <laughs> so, and I was like they use that you you just yeah. did it and so again yeah. that people think it's this complicated difficult thing mm. but it's only complicated because we're socialized to put people in these binary categories and it's exactly what you were saying about when you see someone walking down the street and even mm. you know you saying that you you've been identifying as non-binary or you are sorry you are non-binary in fact mm. <laughs> and, yeah. and that you still have that thing of putting people in gender categories and again I'm very sort of mm. try and be super open and and conscious of all of that but again I and gender is so visible yeah and whereas sexuality like you say is much less visible and I think it's really important to distinguish it's similarly similar with um like race or ethnicity like you can't hide the color of your skin yeah well. and some people can I'm quite light-skinned and if I do my hair in a certain way and it's summer and depending where I am I can be put in different categories at the time mm. Yeah, the visible ones do have a different impact, I think, than the, in, exactly. you know, like it's like saying with invisible disability has exactly. some very different stuff around it than the visible ones. Not not necessarily better or worse, but just diff it's a different thing about these things that are visible on us or invisible. 100%. Um, people, you know, people think, oh, it's never going to trip off the tongue. But uh, having used they so much and having so many friends who are they, I've definitely got to the point now where I will default to they and have to remind myself oh no actually that person that uses a he or a she so it does do become as well. <laughs> does become familiar yeah <laughs> yeah so mm. you were talking about plurality um mm. do you want to talk to us a bit more about what you mean by plurality yeah absolutely it's something I write a lot about these days I suppose the only caveat would be I would want people to go away with the sense that all non-binary people are plural or all bisexual people are plural you know that's not the case at all these are three separate things um but for me they happen to go together um and yeah plurality is the the sense that instead of being a, a kind of singular unified self we have multiple sides to ourselves um and a lot of different therapy and spiritual approaches have this sense in them i suppose it's really important to say a lot of what we're talking about here is very much a, a kind of white western way of seeing things that you know to, to even put sexuality or gender or selfhood in boxes you know is 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 kind of like how how it's done in you know like the uk the us but so many cultures around the world don't do that so many cultures have multiple genders or very different ways of understanding sexuality and the same with selfhood you know that a lot of cultures <coughs> wouldn't think of somebody as like this yeah it's this this kind of idea of this so kind of successful consistent kind of individual that we all have to be in this kind of cultural context you know that rather than being contradictory rather than having different aspects to ourselves um and as I say, uh, quite a lot of therapy approaches 
now use this idea of like parts work or this sense that you know people might be familiar with you know the idea you've got an inner child or you've got an inner critic right it's it's that sort of area and I've just found it yeah really speaks to my experience and there's quite a few communities now for people who identify as plural or as a system rather than individual um and yeah that's where that's where my experience is as well and again it for me it does map onto sexuality and gender in that different parts of me have different sexualities and different genders so um it kind of all comes together but as I say for some non-binary people it's not at all about being plural it's more that they have you know a very static experience of their gender as just being a third gender or as being somehow between masculinity and femininity or um or something else Mm, interesting and so when you have these different parts and I, I like the the idea of a system or even like a constellation mm. of of parts. yeah um do you then so how does it like do you have some dominant ones do you have less dominant ones do you sort of fluctuate between different mm. ones are they all present at the same time tell us a bit more about that yeah it's a yeah great question um it's shifted a lot for me so I did experience myself as a fairly singular individual you know till a few years back um and so I definitely had a dominant part which was that one but I suppose when I had you know sort of uh, what I'd now see as maybe you know a a tough time mental health wise what was happening was things it's more like a, a more vulnerable part of me was coming forward and that at the time was really confusing it's like oh I'm this quite functional you know doing quite a lot of good stuff in the world person and suddenly you know I'm this terrified person you know or occasionally this really angry person um and what's re- yeah it's just really helped me to sort of see that as okay I had these different sides to myself and it was like a different side getting almost like pushed forward or um so so having done a lot of work on it it now feels very much like a team and I'm kind of really aware like it feels different in my body like who's present and who's who's foregrounded and who's backgrounded um you know people use this the term fronting like you know who's fronting at the moment um and generally I have a bit of control over it so certainly if I'm doing an interview like that it's like this it's like a more adult parental part to come and do this interview but then you know after this I might go and have a chat you know with the more vulnerable part of me you know how was that you know it might have been a bit scary for you you know look after that part a bit um yeah so I have a real consistent sense of seven now and I have names for them and we can have kind of conversation first of all we used to write in our journal like between the different parts but now I can kind of talk out loud from them or even you know with with really close friends they they can recognize you know which part is there but that's that's been quite a long process to get to that point yeah Mm. and I guess it requires a lot of self-awareness and practice of checking in with yourself and seeing what's true in that moment and then Mm. you know and it sounds like you still feel like there's yeah there's quite distinguished parts they're quite there's a separation in within those different parts of you so I'm curious as well about yeah and and I I love what you're saying as well about how you know I think it's a good reminder that we're talking about your experiences and that your experiences aren't universal non-binary experiences or universal bisexual experiences yeah we also talked a little bit about fluidity and I know that some Mm. people for example identify as non-binary but feel very gender fluid and sometimes sort of you know alternate between feeling more masculine or more feminine or maybe they have different parts as well but maybe it's more a case of I don't know could you yeah no I think this is all of these things it's so important to see them as like this big umbrella Mm. you know so yeah bisexuality or plurisexual some people use it's like a big umbrella of everyone who's attracted to more than one gender um but under that you know there's going to be some people where it's about sexual attraction some people where it's about romantic attraction it's going to be some people where they're equally attracted to men and women and some people where gender is just not important at all some people who may be specifically attracted to non-binary people you know so there's such a diversity of experience under that umbrella and the same with non-binary gender it's like okay that's everyone who doesn't perfectly fit men man or woman but under that yeah there's people who it's like they're between man and woman there's people who are kind of androgynous there's people who you know really 
look like they fit masculinity or femininity but somewhere inside they really don't you know mm-hmm. there's people who they're a third gender or they just don't buy this whole gender system and think it's all messed up you know and it's more political just such a big range and the same with plural you know there's some people who are really really experience themselves moving between different parts with very little memory you know of what's happening when they're in one part or another like they're quite dissociated between the different parts there's others of us you know who have quite a lot of ongoing conversation between the different parts they're quite um you know in constant communication um there's some people who have you know hundreds or thousands of different parts that they can kind of map and there's others of us where it's just like three or it's just like seven so you know again really different experiences you know some people where they all get on some people where they can't stand each other you know (laughs) a bit both you know it's just yeah like you've just got to imagine just like just like a normative identity like man you know, we can think, well, here's this big umbrella of man, but, you know, there's a vulnerable little boy in there, there's an old old man, there's, the, you know, a kind of rugged masculinity, there's sensitive masculinity, new man, you know, laddie, you know, just a huge range of, like, doing man. Right. Same, same is true for all these other umbrellas. So I think it's just so important to be like, what does it mean to you, mm-hmm. you know? And to remember that, yeah, you're hearing me here talking about my specific experiences of like being queer and being non-binary and being plural. But those, yeah, first of all, those things may not be the same for everybody. Second of all, they mean different things for different people. And third of all, they may change over time. You know, just as, you know, all of those things have changed over time for me, as I've said, they're not things that I was, you know, identifying with as a child. It's like they've become things that really fit me now. Absolutely. And I think that's another good definition of fluidity is just that it can change over Mm. time. And, and I think it's so important when we're talking about identities that aren't fully seen in the mainstream yet, and that aren't fully understood, that it's constantly important to remind people that there's not just one way of doing it because that's so often the the problem with labels is that they're really useful in terms of mm-hmm. finding a community, putting, you know, having a framework on feelings we're having, but then there's a lot of associations with each label. So for example, a lot of people assume that all non-binary people are completely androgynous and mm-hmm. then sort of like either question others when someone identifies non-binary, it's like, well, no, you're not, you look so and yeah. so mm-hmm. <laughs> or can also you know and it can also cause a lot of internalized sort of transphobia non-binary phobia biphobia I know for myself coming out as again bisexual in the umbrella sense of the term I prefer mm-hmm. the terms queer or pansexual but there mm-hmm. was a lot of I had this idea of what bisexual meant and I had a lot of stereotypes associated with that I also had a lot of negative associations like oh if I come out as bisexual then I'll be perceived as like a greedy um, male attention seeking sort mm-hmm. of woman or all these things and I think mm-hmm. I struggle regularly with my gender as well where for me I feel like there's definitely more of a fluidity sometimes I feel very femme sometimes I feel very mask sometimes Mm. it's in between sometimes I forget my own gender but there is definitely a part of me which is like oh no I don't want to like either be insulting to the non-binary community by using a term when you know I get Mm. I have a lot of cis passing privilege for sure or Mm. I don't want to um use it and then make a mistake and change my mind or I don't want Mm. to have to explain it because you know there's all these other things going on and there's yeah yeah we've also talked a little bit without naming it but about intersectionality and I I was going to bring that in there because it's this, like what you say is so accurate that this generally speaking a kind of sense of like but th- so first of all it's really hard to be you know bi or non-binary because the culture doesn't even really believe it exists you know and thinks it's a bad thing but if you even get there then there's this sense of like this is what it is to be this and you've got to be the proper you know and I think it's so sad that our communities sometimes reinforce that sense of like you know you're not trans enough or you're not bi enough you know you have to meet this kind of particular way of doing it which is often a very simple like the 50 50 attraction bisexuality or the kind of androgynous non-binary and then when you bring in intersectionality the other thing to say is those models are nearly always young white slim you know they have a 
particular, you know, again, Western, you know, so, so if, yeah, if you Google for those things online, that's what you get is that sort of stereotypical image. And it also is a really excluding image because nearly always anyone who's got any other kind of marginalizations can't really see themselves, you know, in that. Exactly. And mm. like, I have a friend, lover, partner, I'm not quite sure what to call them yet. <laughs> um, Beyond boxes, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I have, I always refer to what we have as a dynamic rather than a relationship, because mm. I feel like that word has so much less pressure and associations and intensity on it whereas relationship mm. whether even in the broad sense of the word whether it means a friendship or a, a romantic relationship or a sexual relationship as soon as we use the word relationship it put it puts it in a box it puts a whole bunch of associations <laughs> and pressures so saying we have a dynamic is currently my favorite word to describe I love the that they have with I love it so I have a dynamic with someone mm. and they are non-binary and they don't actually have a preferred pronoun. So sometimes I refer to them as they, usually my standards is they, because it's mm. again, the sort of easiest default. Sometimes I'll say she, he, sometimes within the same conversation, I'll switch between them and mm. people listening, I get really confused. Um, but they also, they have, they are white. They mm are attracted exclusively to one gender to, to women um mm. and they uh they are not androgynous they are quite mm. mask presenting and they were born in sort of a masculine body and they um you know and and yet they are non-binary but i can see the parts of me that sometimes see that it, because of intersectionality because they have a lot of systemic privilege mm. that you know i think sometimes I feel similar to, they, to the way they do in terms of my gender identity, but it's a lot mm. easier for them to be able to present that way because they have so much more privilege. It's one thing. Yeah. And often they get, people assume that they're gay because they can present and dress in a very femme way at times. And they mm. look like just a sort of femme or a camp um, man, cis man. Yeah. That's often mm. how they come across. And so it, I, I notice in myself sometimes that there can be a little bit of whether it's sort of judgment or envy mm. or kind of, you know, or disbelief or yeah, but it's not really fair or, you know, or when we're mm. talking about privilege together and I'll say something about, yes, well, straight cis white men and they're like, well, I'm not a cis man. It's like, yes, mm. but you still have a lot of the cis passing privilege, but I also don't want to undermine their yeah. identity, right? And it's so complicated, all of this, these kind of social identities. And that's why this podcast mm. is called Beyond Boxes, because so often it would be so much easier if we could just put everyone in a neat little box. And then yeah. we have a few in between boxes, like bisexual, but everyone who's yeah. bisexual is the same and just likes men and women equally. And okay, maybe we'll have a few non-binary people, but all non-binary yeah. people are basically just androgynous people who look yeah. all exactly the same. You know, yeah. but life is so much more complicated than that. It, and you're so right that we need to hold all these different dimensions. You know, it's like, yeah, it's the, the real complexity that coming out as non-binary is so important to affirm that's the reality for that person and it's also important to look at our gender journeys to that point and that they will be very different like you say if we're if we're white we're likely to have had an easier gender journey actually and you know if and and where we're how we're read by other people currently and how we were in the past is going to really impact you know how what our possibilities are now um so Alex, Ian Taffy and I wrote a book, How to Understand Your Gender, and that this was very much at the heart of that, is this sense of multi-dimensions of gender, you know, that, that include how we identify, but also how we express ourselves, mm -hmm. um, and also how we experience ourselves, and how that's all been over time for us, and, and guess... you know, that, and whether it's matched over time the norm, or whether it's been, you know, if for someone, you know, for someone whose gender hasn't fit the norm from the word go that's a really different life experience mm -hmm. to somebody who it really did for a long time and then it's now changed you know and there's and there's different challenges different tensions and challenges depending you know so it's not even necessarily about saying oh easier for this person or more difficult but different you know but different mm -hmm. and it's just i think it's really important yeah not that we don't wipe those conversations out you know and it, and it can be really easy to feel like oh this is the right way to talk about these things and we mustn't say those things but actually it is important to hold all these complexities 
around each of the intersections and how they intersect with the intersect with each other right exactly yeah. and also like you're talking about the way we feel the way we present but also the way we're perceived because mm-hmm. again you know it's like people who are born in who are born as sort of mixed ethnicities, but then are white passing. And so for me, for example, in my Mm. family, other than my father, who is white, I am the lighter skinned member of my family. And so my brother, he, we have the same parents, but he, you know, passes as black or mixed much more, whereas I'm more sort of exotic. And so Mm. there's, again, there's that kind of, on the one hand, there's more privilege for being lighter skinned. And on the other hand, there's more of a sense of not knowing where I fit in. Yeah long feeling completely in between categories not feeling like you know there's some comfort Mm. in ticking certain boxes but when I have to fill in forms I'm constantly ticking other on all my forms and that's actually where the name (laughs) originally came from for this uh this Mm. channel no, I think it's really important. And again, that's such a good a good way of holding the bothness, right? Of like um in with all of these things there are there are kind of I guess yeah pros and cons or things that it opens up and closes down if we're if we're in the clear category even if it's the marginalized one or if we're in that in-between space you know being in the in-between space opens up a huge amount I really like being there and also it's really difficult in various ways um in the book that Alex and I wrote called life is in binary um I wrote about being mixed class which is when Mm. you rarely hear people talking about um but it's another in between when you know one side of your family were very working class and one were you know upper middle class say and that was that was my first non-binary experience it was really big for me like feeling that sense of I don't quite fit with either of these um and then you know being at school and people not being able to read my class you know in in England that's actually a really big experience you know that yeah. not fitting in terms of class um so so yeah I think it's great to look at all of these and again not to yeah not to be having necessarily a conversation about oh this is you know easier for these people harder for these people but more like what is the nuance of that person's lived experience given where they sit on these various intersecting mm-hmm. axes of oppression and like hold yeah holding those as yeah they can be different and differently challenging and you know how how can we support each other really um, yeah. in that different and re- and see that difference rather than yeah like assuming sameness as you were saying putting people in the boxes 100% and it's about really seeing the individual for who they are and their intersecting identities and zooming out and seeing the context within like yeah. social systems to, if we focus only on the individual and we discount the systemic privileges or the systemic context then that can create more harm than good yeah. because then we we put all the responsibility on the individual as well but if we only focus on the systemic context then a it's hard with all the different intersections and b you know you have to focus on the intersections of marginalization or oppression and the intersections of um privilege as well Mm. and so you know similar to you i also have i guess the in-betweenness of class which i'd never thought of in that way but my Mm. mom comes from a very working class family and my dad comes from a very middle class family but because i grew up in france it was irrelevant i was just the english Mm. (laughs) the english girl anyway and also my mum, who's from a working class family she's well she's mixed but she comes across as she mixed black and Mm. my dad's white so again it's the intersecting for me it wasn't more about so much about class as more about color but then my mum grew up with her mum who is white and so you know again it's all sort of there's all so many different layers there yeah the intergenerational piece as well that you're speaking to that it's where people yeah people it's a really different experience for somebody growing up white with you know whiteness back all the way in their family you know and everyone around them is white that if you're growing up in a very multicultural setting or if you're growing up and you know um like you say there's there's mixedness in your family um back a couple of generations or something it's like we've got we've got to hold all of this I love your sense of like I would see it almost like having a pair of glasses with the individual and the systemic you know mm. and that we need to have both and in so many political movements, there's this an activism, this and social justice, there's this real danger of seeing everything through the systemic lens mm-hmm. and really missing the individual's lived experience of trauma, for example. Mm-hmm. But then in some of the settings, like, you know, sort of 
therapy and maybe like the mindfulness movement and things like that there's this real danger that you just see the individual lens and you're all about that and you miss a lot of this systemic you know which is is hugely impactful um and there's a real danger there that people start to feel there's something wrong with them as an individual rather than seeing that it's actually the systemic oppression that's the problem so I think yeah for me in my writing I'm trying to keep those two lenses on at all times if I can you know <laughs> amazing and it's it's definitely not easy to do but it's so important and I think what you mentioned there is something I, I lead workshops on power privilege and prejudice and that's one of mm. the key things I mentioned that if we don't take into account the systemic as well we start to internalize it so yes because I am a woman and I'm a woman of color and I'm queer and I have a very baby face <laughs> you know I'm mm. often treated as inferior to the sort of norm but the norm isn't normal the norm is straight cis white men and so if mm. I don't recognize that a lot of this is systemic I'll start believing that me Jaya is the problem that I am yeah. less than rather than being like oh I live in a society where I've been made to believe that where I've been made to feel that and I need to focus on you know recognizing that undoing those beliefs so that I can you know live my fullest and bestest life <laughs> agreed yeah I think it's so important and we're just in a culture that tells us all the time there's something wrong with us that needs fixing you know because that's how it controls people and that's also how it sells a lot of products and um yeah my my writing it's always been really important to try and reveal that and to resist that if we can um which involves really seeing all the systemic oppression that's going on and how some bodies and lives are treated as more valuable than others you know we've talked a lot about in between us and the different ways we can have these feelings of in between us but mm. what is the harm in therefore in the opposite in having binaries and having fixed boxes and binaries and and not you know yeah mm. let's talk about that well my view is it harms everyone so i think you know an obvious harm is that usually with binaries there's also a hierarchy so there is a sense that, that some, you know, that men are more normal or better than women, for example, or white people more than black people or, you know, um, straight more than gay, you know. So most of the binaries come also with this hierarchy built in. It's all about this, um, this old, like, scientific project of trying to find out who's normal, like you say, and like, define the normal and then the other. Mm -hmm. you know and that really it does date back to kind of colonialism that we can justify colonizing um other people if we can say that they're less normal or that they need our help you know because they're inferior or something that it was sort of all about the victorian time when that's what was happening or you know or enslaving people or exploiting people um or eradicating people in the eugenics movement that's where that comes from you know not not everyone all over the planet has that belief that some people are in the normal category and some people are in the other category you know it, it kind of was an invention and it's a really dangerous invention you know and and you know so, so that's that's a really big problem you know with binaries is that they're gen they generally date back to that and that's that's kind of what they're invested in doing but also that they're usually pretty bad for the people who are in the um the normal category as well you know that people who are trying rigidly to fit to the idea of what heterosexuality is or what masculinity is actually you know we know the statistics on uh, suicide in men are really high because so many men are trying to conform to this um kind of model of masculinity which is that you don't talk about your feelings that you are there to support others but you don't need support and you mustn't reach out for support you mustn't ever be vulnerable you mustn't be anything that could be seen as feminine um you know or or you know or even loving you know it's just it's really dangerous that that kind of toxic masculinity and it's really really hard to to get away from when we've got this binary model of gender which sees femininity and masculinity as opposite um in that way and puts a lot of pressure and responsibility on men and, and similarly with you know heterosexuality like a lot of people who are heterosexual are not very happy because there's this kind of ideal of how you must manifest heterosexuality that's again pretty rigid um like one statistic found that about half of people um think that they've got some kind of sexual dysfunction 
you know, because there's this kind of model in the heterosexuality that people should be having penis and vagina sex like twice a week for their whole lives with the same person. And like very few people can actually do that. <laughs> and even fewer people actually enjoy that, you know, yeah. so, um, you know, so yeah, that, you know, heterosexuality isn't great for heterosexual people. So yeah, that's, so that's always my kind of way of seeing it. It's like these binaries, they're really bad for the marginalized people. Um, they're really, really bad for people who don't fit the binary, who are invisible or erased, but they're also really bad for the people who even do fit the kind of norm or the one that's that's seen as 100%. better. Yeah. And it, I think because you've spoken a lot about those who fit the sort of dominant binary, I think there's just as much issues with those who fit the sort of um, marginalized binary. Mm. So whether it's women, um, you know, homosexuality, um, what are some other examples we've been given, you know, sort of people of color or black mm. people, it's and it's the same kind of and that's why I think sometimes because you know, and you, you talk a lot about this in your book, Rewriting the Rules, but also mm. I think in general, but it's the, all binaries, like you're saying, are harmful. And even, and sometimes those of us that are in between, we get sort of invisibilized, discredited, and sort of shunned by both sides. Of the yes. Because yeah. we're sort of, you know, we're almost, people have fought so much for their rights being marginalized, being oppressed and mm. for to be recognized, to be legitimized. And then all those who are non-binary in any kind of way sort of question that. And they also, maybe there's also a question of privilege, feeling like we have more privilege, which is true to some degree, but mm. you know, and that's, there's a lot of biphobia from the sort of uh, gay mm. and lesbian community. I know that even within like, for example, I mean, already within from women, there's a lot of transphobia and non-binary phobia. So, so uh, do you want to say anything about that? No, I think you're right. And I think the, the gay bi one is a really good example historically that there was a sense, you know, that, that the gay rights movement did buy in to the binary of like, okay, there's the straight people who have all the privilege and then there's a few you know sort of small minority of gay people and we need the same we need to get the same rights as straight people and then in that movement bisexuality was seen as kind of muddying the water you know or sort of making it difficult um and there was a you know and also this a lot of suspicion around bi, bi people like you say like being able to move between or something and um yeah and it, what what the impact was on on bi people was you know really severe and definitely um, related to mental health problems because a lot of people were coming out in straight community and feeling shunned and then they were going to the obvious place which was kind of LGB community and finding actually that there was a lot of biphobia there like I remember marching on pride marches you know 10 years back and having you know under a bi flag and having people shout from the edges you know make your mind up and get yeah. off the fence and you know really yeah biphobic kind of stuff um or just go quiet like the crowd would just go quiet when we walked by it was horrible um I think in my experience there's less of that in trans community that I've I, certainly my experience was that non-binary people have been very welcomed um but yeah there's sometimes some tensions there um but yeah I think it happens as you say in in, in a lot of these places and it's just about yeah trying to get away from a, mo a model where there's the privileged folks you know who have these rights and that we want to we want to get our group up there into that place where we also have those rights or we're also treated well and then we kind of pull up the drawbridge you know we're done um and it's much more going to kind of black feminist thought which is like until everyone is free nobody is free right we've Absolutely. got to get everyone up there you know or like dismantle the whole the whole thing more likely you know get you know just get everybody treated equally well like everybody equally valued mm -hmm. um and it doesn't work if we're still exploiting people on the other side of the world and it doesn't work if we're still <laughs> you know damaging the planet and it doesn't work if you know um we're throwing disabled people under the bus and you know it's just like we have to we have to that's where intersectionality is so vital as a theory right it's like we have to look at all those intersections and dismantle all those oppressions we can't just focus on the one that impacts us personally for example because it won't work it just simply won't work even if we are in it for ourselves if we, we've got a selfish kind of you know it, it won't work until we've dismantled them all because they're all interlinked you know
Absolutely. And all the while that there's, you know, one group has power over another group, you know, it's not going to work. It's not until, yeah. and I, again, I talk a lot about this in my workshops and this kind of, mm. sense of inclusion and you can't just, and that's the issue with like trans exclusionary feminism or white feminism, or mm. like what you were saying about the gay movement, you know, this mm. idea that those at the top have all the power. And if we can get to the top as well, then everything will be okay. Ignoring yeah. the fact that there's system, that all the systems in place are so messed up. And until we dismantle the systems and it's not yeah. just about getting your own group to the top it's about dismantling the systems that divide us and separate us and pit us against each other and actually yes. coming together as a community to create a more inclusive environment and society for everyone and an equitable society oh and if only we could do it because if exactly. you actually think about the numbers you know in terms of if all the marginalized people got together and we're you know we're sort of working together in solidarity then that is most people you know I actually know. This kind of privileged, you know, is actually this really tiny minority. You know, they're not the norm at all. They're like very un, un you know, and, and even actually if you got that sort of small tiny group of the straight white cis men or whatever we, we want to say that group is, you'd find that actually a bunch of them were attracted to, you know, more than one gender or were kinky or, or you know, have had, a disability or yeah, you know, or at, at some point in their life, yeah, will have a disability at some point in their life, will become vulnerable in various ways. So it's just, yeah it's it's completely sort of built on sand really um but it but it's what everybody's so kind of invested in and it's yeah a big job big job to do something different yeah well on that note I think we're almost coming to the end so how what advice do you have for people who have listened to this realize that you know that they'd like to be supportive to non-binary community and trans community how can people be allies that's a really good question um I think, you know, this thing that we were saying about mirroring people as they experience themselves is really important. So trying to do that as much as possible. And if you're finding it difficult, then practicing, you know, I always think, yeah, if you want to practice they pronouns, then just call, you know, all animals where you don't know their gender, you know, start calling them they and then it will start to get a bit more familiar. Um, but also I really like there's a great trans creator called uh, Travis Alabanza who says like, what would it be right? What would it be like if we treated trans as a gift? You know, so trying to move away from this idea of trans certainly as a threat, but even as a loss, you know, that it's instead of, you know, somebody comes out as trans in your friendship group or family, it's like, wow, like we could all now learn, we can all have conversations about gender now, we can learn a lot about ourselves, you know, we can up our game when it comes to being trans supportive, you know, so, yeah, trying to shift that understanding, I think, to, to trans as being yeah, a real gift and something that, that points out the whole all the flaws in this gender system that we're stuck stuck with and how bad that is for everybody. Yeah, and that's great advice. I guess it's got, again a constant learning process, really, and a constant interrogation of this. Um, and I think that's it's really valuable for people. If if there's areas where you feel like really insecure and anxious about and maybe those kind of fears of getting it wrong and that kind of shame feeling the best thing you can do is kind of go into the that area and like really look at how it's been in your life you know and I think that's what marginalized groups are constantly trying to encourage more privileged groups to do right so it's like if you know if you feel if you're straight and you feel kind of insecure about these conversations like really look at your sexuality you know do some real self-reflection and what you'll probably find is you know you realize it's so much more complicated for you too and then you can be in a room with somebody else who it's complicated for you know and you can share and you can feel kind of grounded um until we've done our own self-reflection it's really hard to have these conversations without like just bringing a whole load of fear and shame or, or defensiveness to the conversation mm, thank you mm. for that and because we were talking about you know to create a truly inclusive society it's not just about getting ourselves to the top it's also about including others what mm. are some ways that you feel that you're an ally to people with more intersections of oppression or from groups that are more marginalized yeah, I mean, it's it's really important to me. And, you know, I think it, it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely some problems around the term ally. I think it is one that's a bit like you don't want to call yourself one. I'm always trying to learn 
on all of these intersections you know and it's and it's hard to be constantly learning about all of them because it's it's a lot right but I, I do I'm doing my best and um, two things I really try and do is the the graphic guides I write which are kind of like these comic introductions to things like gender mm -hmm. and sexuality really for me those are an invitation to people into a bunch of other people's work so almost like each page has like somebody a, you know a comic of somebody on talking and what I try and do with those books is make them into invitations for people to find out more about mostly people who are more marginalized than me you know who have really really important thoughts on these matters or really important practices to share um, and then the other thing in, in the books that Alexi and Taffy and I write I suppose we we're really most of the kind of philosophies or ideas that we're building on um, come from, um, you know, black feminism, particularly indigenous philosophy, um, Buddhist thoughts, you know, so don't come from a white Western context. And, and we try and be really explicit about that, that we think the most valuable kind of knowledges and practices um, mostly do come from, from marginalized groups, including groups who are more marginalized even than the, the two of us who are writing the book so we, we try and be really explicit about that and again try and encourage people to go and find out more about those bodies of knowledge um, and those kind of practices rather rather than you know try appropriating them and, and in any way trying to pass them off as our own ideas you know that, that, that's the aim anyway fantastic thank mm. you so much that was a great answer and MJ how can people find out more about you and your work um, yeah, if there's, it, my website's called rewritingtherules.com, but also if you just Google my name, that's probably what will come up. Um, and that's the website's got um, links to all of my books and also lots of blog posts and some free books and zines as well that people can just download off there and find out more about these things. Um, so yeah, if you, if you like this stuff, then there's plenty there. Um, and, and links to, you know, other stuff, other podcasts I've done and things like that too. Fantastic. And your social media handles? Um, it's Meg John Barker on Twitter. Um, that's really the, the main one I use for my work. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, check out Meg John Barker, Rewriting the Rules and Meg John Barker on Twitter. And if you want to find out more about me and my work, my name's Jaya Bristow and you can go to jayabristow.com. And my handles are at beyond underscore boxes on Instagram and at beyond boxes on all other platforms. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much, Meg John, for joining me today. You're welcome. <laughs>